this without any further ado let's get started introduction it is a natural assumption that in philosophy before we start to deal with its proper subject matter viz the actual cognition of what truly is one must first of all come to an understanding about cognition which is regarded either as the instrument to get hold of the absolute or as the medium through which one discovers it a certain uneasiness seems justified, partly because there are different types of cognition, and one of them might be more appropriate than another for the attainment of this goal, so that we could make a bad choice of means, and partly because cognition is a faculty of a definite kind and scope, and thus, without a more precise definition of its nature and limits, we might grasp clouds of error instead of the heaven of truth. This feeling of uneasiness is surely bound to be transformed into the conviction that the whole project of securing for consciousness through cognition what exists in itself is absurd, and that there is a boundary between cognition and the absolute that completely separates them. For if cognition is the instrument for getting hold of absolute being, it is ob obvious that the use of an instrument on a thing certainly does not let it be what it is for itself, but rather sets out to reshape and alter it. If, on the other hand, Cognition is not an instrument of our activity, but a more or less passive medium through which the light of truth reaches us. Then again, we do not receive the truth as it is in itself, but only as it, as, as it exists through and in this medium. Either way, we employ a means which immediately brings about the opposite of its own end. Or rather, what is really absurd is that we should make use of a means at all. It would seem, to be sure, that this evil could be remedied through an acquaintance with the way in which the instrument works, for this would enable us to eliminate from the representation of the absolute that which we have gained through it whatever, whatever is due to the instrument, and thus get the truth in its purity. But this improvement would in fact only bring us back to where we were before. If we remove from a reshaped thing what the instrument has done to it, then the thing, here the absolute, becomes for us exactly what it was before this accordingly superfluous effort. On the other hand, if the absolute is supposed merely to be brought nearer to us through this instrument, without anything in it being altered, like a bird caught in a lime twig, it would surely laugh our little ruse to scorn, if it were not with us, in and for itself, all along, and of its own volition. For a ruse is just what cognition would be in such a case, since it would, with its manifold exertions, be giving itself the air of doing something quite different from creating a merely immediate and therefore effortless relationship. Or, if by testing cognition, which we conceive of as a medium, we get to know the law of its refraction, it is again useless to subtract us from the end result. For it is not the refraction of the ray, but the ray itself, whereby truth reaches us, that is cognition. And if this were removed, all that would be indicated would be a pure direction or a blank space. absolute. 
aside on the grounds that there is a type of cognition which, though it does not cognize the absolute as science aims to, is still true, and that cognition in general, though it be incapable of grasping the absolute, is still capable of grasping other kinds of truth. But we gradually come to see that this kind of talk, which goes back and forth, only leads to a hazy distinction between an absolute truth and some other kind of truth, and that words like absolute, cognition, etc. presuppose a meaning which has yet to be ascertained. 76. Instead of troubling ourselves with such useless ideas and locutions about cognition as an instrument for getting hold of the absolute, or as a medium through which we view the truth, relationships which surely in the end are what all these ideas of cognition cut off from the absolute, and an absolute separated from cognition amount to, instead of putting up with excuses which create the incapacity of science by assuming relationships of this kind in order to be exempt from the hard work of science, while at the same time giving the impression of working seriously and zealously. Instead of bothering to refute all these ideas, we could reject them out of hand as ad adventitious and arbitrary, and the words associated with them like absolute, cognition, objective and subjective, and countless others whose meaning is assumed to be generally familiar, could even be regarded as so much deception. For to give the impression that their meaning is generally well known, or that their notion is comprehended, looks more like an attempt to avoid the main problem, which is precisely to provide this notion. We could, with better justification, simply spare ourselves the trouble of paying any attention whatever to such ideas and locutions, for they are intended to ward off science itself, and constitute merely an empty appearance of knowing which vanishes immediately as soon as science comes on the scene. But science, just because it comes on the scene, is itself an appearance. In coming on the scene it is not yet science in its developed and unfolded truth. In this connection it makes no difference whether we think of science as the appearance, because it comes on the scene alongside other, an, another mode of knowledge, or whether we call that other untrue knowledge its manifestation. In any case, science must liberate itself from this semblance, and it can only do and it, can do, and it can do so only by turning against it. For, when confronted with a knowledge that is without truth, science can neither merely reject it as an ordinary way of looking at things, while assuring us it is that its science is quite a different sort of cognition for which that ordinary knowledge is of no account whatever, nor can it appeal to the vulgar view for the intimations it gives us of something better to come. By the former assurance, science would be declaring its power to lie simply in its being, but the untrue knowledge likewise appeals to the fact that it is, and assures us that for its science is of no account. One bare assurance is worth just as much as another. Still less can science appeal to whatever intimations of something better it may detect in the cognition that is without truth, to the signs which point in, its, in the direction of science. For one thing, it would only be appealing again to what merely is, and for another, it would only be appealing to itself, and to itself in the mode in which it exists in the cognition that is without truth. In other words, it would be appealing to an inferior form of its being, to the way it appears, rather than to what it is in and for itself. It is for this reason that an exposition of how knowledge makes its appearance will here be undertaken. as the way of despair, for what happens on it 
result. 
thus consciousness suffers this violence at its own hands. It spoils its own limited satisfaction. When consciousness feels this violence, its anxiety may well make it retreat from the truth and strive to hold on to what it is in danger of losing. But it can find no peace. If it wishes to remain in a state of unthinking inertia, then thought troubles its thoughtlessness, and its own unrest disturbs its inertia. Or if it entrenches itself in sentimentality, which assures us that it finds everything to be good in its kind, then this assurance likewise suffers violence at the hands of reason, for precisely in so far as something is merely a kind, reason finds it not to be good. Or again, its fear of the truth may lead consciousness to hide from itself and others, behind the pretension that its burning zeal for truth makes it difficult or even impossible to find any other truth but the unique truth of vanity that of being at any rate cl cleverer than any thoughts that one gets by oneself or from others. This conceit which understands how to belittle every truth in order to turn back into itself and gloat over its own understanding, which knows how to dissolve every thought and always find the same barren ego instead of any content, this is a satisfaction which we must leave to itself, for it flees from the universal and seeks only to be for itself. In addition to these preliminary general remarks about the manner and the necessity of the progression, it may be useful to say something about the method of carrying out the inquiry. If this exposition is viewed as a way of relating science to phenomenal knowledge, and as an investigation and examination of the reality of cognition, it would seem that it cannot take place without some presupposition which can serve as its underlying criterion. For an examination consists in applying an accepted standard and in determining whether something is right or wrong on the basis of the resulting agreement or disagreement of the thing examined. Thus the standard as such, and science likewise if it were the criterion, is accepted as the essence or as the in itself. But here, where science has just begun to come on the scene, neither science nor anything else has yet justified itself as the essence or the in itself, and without something of the sort it seems that no examination can take place. 82. This contradiction and its removal will become more definite if we call to mind the abstract determinations of truth and knowledge as they occur in consciousness. Consciousness simultaneously distinguishes itself from something and at the same time relates itself to it, or, as it is said, this something exists for consciousness, and the determinate aspect of this relating or of the being of something for a consciousness is knowing. But we distinguish this being for another from being in itself. Whatever is related to knowledge or knowing is also distinguished from it, and posited as existing outside of this relationship. This being in itself is called truth. Just what might be involved in these determinations is of no further concern to us here. Since our object is phenomenal knowledge, its determinations do will at first be taken directly as they present themselves. And they do present themselves very much as we have already apprehended them. 83. Now, if we inquire into the truth of knowledge, it seems that we are asking what knowledge is in itself. Yet in this inquiry, knowledge is our object, something that exists for us, and the in itself that would supposedly result from it would rather be the being of knowledge for us. What we asserted to be its essence would be not so much, tr much its truth, but rather just our knowledge of it. Essence or criterion would lie within ourselves, and that which was to be compared with it, and about which a decision would be reached through this comparison, would not necessarily have to recognise the validity of such a standard. 84. But the dissociation, or this semblance of dissociation and presupposition, is overcome by the nature of the object we are investigating. Consciousness provides its own criterion from within itself, so that the investigation becomes a comparison of consciousness with itself for the distinction made above falls within it. In consciousness, one thing exists for another, i.e. consciousness regularly contains the determinateness of the moment of knowledge. At the same time, this other is to consciousness not merely for it, but is also outside of this relationship or exists in itself, the moment of truth. Thus in what consciousness affirms from within itself as being in itself or the true, we have the standard which consciousness itself sets up by which to measure what 
consists in seeing whether the notion corresponds to the object. But if we call the essence, or in itself, of the object the notion, and on the other hand understand by the object the notion itself as object, viz, as it exists for an other, then the examination consists in seeing whether the object corresponds to its notion. It is evident, of course, that two procedures are the same, but the essential point to bear in mind throughout the whole investigation is that these two moments, notion and object, being for another and being in itself, both fall within that knowledge which we are investigating. Consequently, we do not need to import criteria, or to make use of our own bright ideas and thoughts during the course of the inquiry. It is precisely when we leave these aside that we succeed in contemplating the matter in hand as it is in and for itself. superfluous since notion and object, the criterion and what is to be tested, are present in conscious consciousness itself, but we are also spared the trouble of comparing the two and really testing them, so that since what consciousness examines is its own self, all that is left for us to do is simply to look on. For consciousness is, on the one hand, consciousness of the object, and on the other, consciousness of itself, consciousness of what for it it is the true consciousness of its knowledge of the truth, since both are for the same consciousness, this consciousness is itself their comparison, for it is for this same consciousness to know whether its knowledge of the object corresponds to the object or not. The object, it is true, seems only to be for consciousness in the way that consciousness knows it. It seems that consciousness cannot, as it were, get behind the object as it exists for consciousness, so as to examine what the object is in itself and hence, too, cannot test its own knowledge by that standard. But the distinction between the in itself and knowledge is already present in the very fact that consciousness knows an object at all. Something is for it, the in itself, and knowledge, or the being of the object for consciousness is, for it, another moment. Upon this distinction, which is present as a fact, the examination rests. If the comparison shows that these two moments do not correspond to one another, it would seem that consciousness must alter its knowledge to make it conform to the object. But, in fact, in the alteration of the knowledge, the object itself alters for it too, for the knowledge that was present was essentially a knowledge of the object. As the knowledge changes, so too does the object, for it essentially belonged to this knowledge. Hence it comes to pass for consciousness that what it previously took to be the in itself is not an in itself, or that it was only an in itself for consciousness. Since consciousness thus finds that its knowledge does not correspond to its object, the object itself does not stand the test. In other words, the criterion for testing is altered when that for which it was to have been the criterion fails to pass the test. And the testing is not only a testing of what we know, but also a testing of the criterion of what knowing is. 86. Inasmuch as the new true object issues from it, this dialectical movement which consciousness exercises on itself and which affects both its knowledge and its object is precisely what is called experience, erfahrung. In this connection, there is a moment in the process just mentioned which must be brought out more clearly, for though it and for through it a new light will be thrown on the exposition which follows. Consciousness knows something. This object is the essence or the in itself but it is also for consciousness the in itself. This is where the ambiguity of this truth enters. We see that consciousness now has two objects. One is the first in itself, the second is the being for consciousness of this in itself. The latter appears at first sight to be merely the reflection of consciousness into itself, i.e. what consciousness has in mind is not an object, but only its knowledge of that first object. But as was shown previously, the first object, in being known, is altered for consciousness. It ceases to be the in itself and becomes something that the in itself, that is the in itself only for consciousness. And this then is the true, the being for consciousness of this in itself. Or, in other words, this is the essence or the object of consciousness. This new object contains the nothingness of the first. It is what experience has made of it. 
itself becomes the second object. It usually seems to be the case, on the contrary, that our experience of the untruth of our first notion comes by way of a second object, which we come upon by chance and externally, so that our part in all this is simply the pure apprehension of what is in and for itself. From the present viewpoint, however, the new object shows itself to have come about through a reversal of consciousness itself. This way of looking at the matter is something contributed by us, by means of which the succession of experiences through which consciousness passes is raised into a scientific progression, but it is not known to the consciousness that we are observing. But, as a matter of fact, we have here the same situation as the one discussed in regard to the relation between our exposition and scepticism, viz. that in every case the result of an untrue mode of knowledge must not be allowed to run away into an empty nothing, but must necessarily be grasped as the nothing of, of that from which it results, a result which contains what was true in the preceding knowledge. It shows up here like this. Since what first appeared as the object sinks for consciousness to the level of its way of knowing it, and since the in itself becomes a being for consciousness of the in itself, the latter is now the new object. Herewith a new pattern of consciousness comes on the scene as well, for which the essence is something different from what it was at the preceding stage. It is this fact that guides the entire series of the patterns of consciousness in their necessary sequence, but it is just this necess necessity itself, or the origination of the new object, that presents itself to consciousness without it understanding how this happens which proceeds for us, as it were, behind the back of consciousness. Thus, in the movement of consciousness there occurs a moment of being in itself, or being for us, which is not present to the consciousness comprehended in the experience itself. The content, however, of what presents itself to us does exist for it. We comprehend only the formal aspect of that content, or its pure origination. For it, what has thus arisen exists only as an object. For us, it appears at the same time as movement and a process of becoming. 88. Because of this necessity, the way to science is itself already science, and hence, in virtue of its content, is the science or the of the experience of consciousness. 89. The experience of itself which consciousness goes through can, in accordance with its notion, comprehend nothing less than the entire system of consciousness, or the entire realm of the truth of spirit. For this reason, the moments of this truth are exhibited in their own proper determinateness, viz. as being not abstract moments, but as they are for consciousness, or as consciousness itself stands forth in its relation to them. Thus the moments of the whole are patterns of consciousness. In pressing forward, 